I am so sorry, I was on mute, so I'll start again. Hi, I'm Maria Cantabai and welcome to the BAFTA Film Sessions Leading Actor. This virtual series celebrates the nominees from this year's EE British Academy Film Awards. Some housekeeping before we start. Uh, join the conversation on social using the hashtag EE If you have a question, please use the Q&A function if you're joining us on Zoom. And if you're joining us via Facebook or YouTube, please put your question in the chat. We will try and get to as many of those questions as possible um, during the session. There is closed captioning available now, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen via the CC button. We are joined this evening by Riz Ahmed, Adash Gaurav, Mads Mikkelsen and Zaha Rahim. Also nominated this year as Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and Anthony Hopkins for The Father. Welcome all of you and congratulations on your nomination this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to start um, for a question for all of you. Um, the very notion of film as a biography, perhaps on your own lives, the idea that you spend so much time in the preparation for a role and the production of a role in the press and promotion um, of the films that you've worked on. What was it in particular about each of these roles that you're nominated for um, that drew you to this in particular to kind of give up kind of so much of your life to put into these specific roles? Um, Riz, I might come to you first on that. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it usually starts off in a pretty straightforward way it's if the script is amazing. We were really lucky with um, with our film, Sound of Metal, Darius Marder and his brother, Abraham Marder, had been working on the on the script for about 13 years. It was one of those labors of love that, it, you know, one of those films that just wasn't getting made, but he kept working on it, kept working on it for over a decade. So the script was brilliant. That was the first thing. And then after that, for me, is a lot of the time, it's about the chemistry. And so um, I met up with Darius and I just loved him. I mean, you've spoken to him in Q and A's as well before, right? You see what his energy is. It's just like, he's this big bear who's just kind of got so much love and heart. And it was clear he was going to give it 110%. And he expected that from everyone. He said, you know, whoever plays this role has to learn how to play the drums, has to learn American sign language. It just felt like such a big challenge, such a big adventure. Um, it's kind of unique, you know, you don't often get that kind of opportunity to throw yourself in 110% like that. And, know that director is going to going to do the same and has already done that. Um, so that's what just kind of made it so attractive. It, it was almost that was what the deal was going into it. It's like, I've already been doing this for over a decade. Who's who wants to come and go and, you know, get down this crazy rabbit hole with me. And um, he seemed like a good partner to do it. Um, we're going to come back to kind of immersing into the role and learning kind of play the drums and American Sign Language. But Sahar, if I can come to you next and the Mauritanian, um, again, a kind of a role that I think is, um, must have been very, very difficult to kind of take on, especially as it's based on someone kind of living today. Um, what did you have, if any concerns at all, kind of taking on this role to begin with? And again, what drew you to the film? Uh, first of all, it's Kevin. I worked with him 10 years ago and uh, we stayed good friends. And uh, he sent me a text, saying I might have a nice part for you. So uh, when I received the script, I, you know, the title at that time was Guantanamo Diary. So uh, uh, for a second, for a very short moment, I thought it would be, maybe there was, you know, endless stereotypical parts you can get, you know, from Hollywood or Europe. And, uh, and I know Kevin, I know he's clever. So uh, I'm like, come on, it's you. So I read the script and uh, just technically, the part is a real gift for an actor. But while I was reading it, I felt so many different feelings inside of myself. I was angry, sad, and absolutely blown away by uh, Mohamedou, because it's mm. a true story. So when I, I cried as well, which is very rare for an actor when you read a script to cry. It never happened to me before. And when I 
when I finished the script, I, I just called Kevin and I said, man, uh, I'm in. I, I really wanted to be part of these people who are doing him justice. And Adash, kind of the white tiger, obviously, um, internationally best-selling novel, winning the Man Booker Prize. But um, there's a little bit of legacy already to take on kind of, you know, a role that so many people have pictured in their own heads when they've been reading it. But what was it kind of in the, in the initial readings of the script that kind of you were kind of desperate to take it on? First of all, thank you so much for having me, Maria. It's an honor for me to be sharing this table with such esteemed gentlemen. Um, I think, uh, you know, Tess Joseph, who is the casting director of the film, she's one of only two casting directors from India uh, at present who cast for international films. And uh, <clears throat> I got a call from her, from her office saying that, um, you know, there's a film that they're casting for. And at that point in time, they hadn't revealed the name of the film. They just sent me a couple of scenes. And um, I was actually just very, very excited to be receiving a call from Tessa's office because it was the first time that I was getting an opportunity to audition with her. And I've secretly always harbored the desire to work internationally, but some, you know, somehow it never came together. So when I got this opportunity, I said, you know, um, I'd take it with both hands. So when I read the scene, even though it wasn't mentioned that it was the white tiger, I knew it was the white tiger because I'd read it as a teenager, I read the book. So when Balram's name was mentioned there, I said, aha, this is the white tiger. So film is being made on it. <laughs> and um, I read the scenes and I went to audition for it. And I swear when I went to audition, the only thought in my head was that I need to give a good enough audition so that I get called for another audition from Tess. Because even the thought of entertaining, the thought of entertaining the fact that I could ever get to play Balram just seems so bizarre because I felt that this is such a big film. And, uh, you know, that somebody like me is now going to get cast for this. So one thing led to the next and then five rounds later and a month later, Ramin called me from New York and said that, you know, um, they want me to play Balram and it was, uh, it was just unbelievable for me. But I guess one of the most attractive parts about the film was of course, um, the story in itself. It's such an extraordinary story of, of a man from the darkness to the light and, um, you know, the kind of changes that he witnesses on the way and the kind of people that he meets. And um, I guess it was just an opportunity for me to embody uh, a person that I, that I hadn't played before. And it was something that was very far from who I am. And it gave me that chance to really explore myself as an, as an actor um, by being Balram. So, and of course, the opportunity to work with somebody like Ramin, who I've been a big fan of, you know. Uh, I, I'd watched Man Pushcart and Goodbye Solo and when I got to know he was directing the film, I was just very, very excited. Um, and Mads, um, an, uh, another round, obviously, you've worked with Thomas Winterberg before, but I suppose what Bar uh, with Adash sorry, mentioned and kind of going in from the darkness to the light, kind of Martin is in a way kind of going from a fog to some sort of light kind of in, in this social, mm. would you call it a social experiment that, um, that you're carrying out? What was it kind of initially that drew you to the role? Well, I think it's a mix of what uh, uh, Tahar said and, mm. and Riz. Uh, Thomas was uh, uh, the main reason because we worked together, as you said, seven, mm. eight odd years ago. And I really wanted to work with him again. Um, and uh, so he pitched me the story about this, um, four high school teachers uh, whose lives has come to a standstill and they tried to you know, recharge their, their, their batteries through uh, drinking a little, but only while they're working. Um, and that sounded fun and great. So I said yes right away. Uh, but I also knew that the story would be so much more about uh, life. And Thomas has an ability to place ordinary people in extraordinary situations so we can relate to them. And, uh, and it didn't disappoint me. The script was absolutely beautiful. So, so those were the two reasons why I said yes. And, and then a few days before I started shooting, a disaster hit Thomas and his family. And, and so it became uh, not only a, a film I wanted to do, it became a necessity, it became the most important thing I've ever done in my life. And, um, and it turned out luckily into something that we're all proud of. Yeah, it's turned out, it's turned out to be a beautiful film. Um, I wanted to talk to all of you, but I sort of stick with you at the moment, Matt, on kind of the idea of process. Um, I, the, as an actor, 
Um, I wouldn't know, but I imagine the kind of performing drunk while trying to be sober is quite a difficult feat in itself. And kind of, and also the kind of ensemble piece of all four of you doing that together. Um, how did you all work with Thomas to kind of create the kind of an illusion that obviously seems very authentic? Well, a lot, there's a lot of different stages in that. You know, um, I think for most actors playing drunk, uh, you would approach it a little like we do in real life. If you come home from the pub and you don't want your, your wife to know that you've been having a couple of pints, mm -hmm. that means you're hiding it. So, so, the, uh, so the slightly drunk version is always hide it, hide it. And that obviously gives you away because you move a little more restrained, a little more precise, too precise, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those are like the, should we say the easy ways of playing drunk, but then when you get up to the higher levels. This is where the danger starts. This is why you, it gives you away if you're not if you're not nailing it. It's just mm -hmm. so obvious. So what we did, we did a we did a boot camp before we started mm -hmm. shooting, and we tested out all the the exact levels of, of you know <laughs> zero five, zero eight, <laughs> zero one, um, and we tested out some of the scenes and we filmed the whole thing. We had a great time. So so if you're sitting four guys knowing each other well and you had a few few shots maybe four. It doesn't seem that odd. It's kind of like, it's, 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 it's normal. But when you see the video the next day, it gets you away. <laughs> All of a sudden, your hands are doing stuff that you didn't tell them to do. And that little lesp you had 40 years ago, it's back. Um, so that was coming in really handy. And for the complete hammered stuff, we watched a lot of YouTube videos. For some reason, it's all this Russian people who film themselves when they're drinking a lot. Yeah. And, <laughs> and for that, we were just... We, we, we didn't test it out. We just watched it and, and got inspired. But so we could turn up and down on the volume. Uh, uh, and and that, was, that was coming in hand. Obviously, we couldn't drink shooting because there's a tendency, if you drink too much, there is no dialogue anymore. No, no Maya, I imagine drinking for 12 hours straight on a set is probably not going to be very productive after a little while. And, 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 and for 60 days straight, no. Yeah. <laughs> Um, also, obviously, you've done very many English speaking roles um, and obviously a lot of Danish roles. Is there, um, do you notice a difference in yourself as an actor kind of with, with between languages? Is there yeah. a kind of, a, uh, how, yeah. Yeah, what? yeah it's, it's hard to put my finger on it now. I think that first few times I did it, it was obviously a, an extra character. It was me speaking English. Mm -hmm. I had to get used to how I would do that as a person. So that was the first act character. And then secondly, the real character. The more I've done it, the more I can focus on the character, which is the important part, of course. But, but I've done quite a few different languages in my career. And it's always the case that you have to get past that part so you can get to the real character, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always say it might be an excuse. I don't mind people having an accent. I, I, I find it hard when people put on an accent and we notice it too long. So just have one. That's my excuse. Uh, and then and get past it. Yeah. Um, and then Riz coming back to kind of the idea, obviously, when language, well, when verbal communication is taken away completely and um, you have to kind of, that's your, con your connection to the world is taken away as it is for your character, Ruben, in Sound of Metal. Um, a lot of it's finding, it, finding this new identity. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to skip back. I'm going to first of all talk about kind of how what how much you had to learn to kind of relearn to had to learn then to forget. So obviously to learn drumming um, as, as a process, and then obviously um, nonverbal communication with American Sign Language, and kind of the hybrids of learning things that you then have to sometimes even forget in the role. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in terms of um, process, I guess. Um, you know, similar to what Maz is saying, there's, you know, there's always some kind of boot camp. For this one in particular, it was just a very kind of long boot camp. Um, it was about seven months of every day uh, drumming for a few hours. My drum, is, drum teacher, Guy Licata, who's so patient, you know, I was so, so badly coordinated. I still am. Um, and uh, the particular kind of drumming we we're doing with the double pedaling and stuff and I'm left-handed and so sometimes when you're left-handed you do some things right-handed some things left-handed so we kept switching around the drums going maybe he'll be better if we play them right-handed no I'm still <laughs> crap okay maybe we'll switch around left-handed so it just kept going back and forth um so it was drumming every day for seven months and then also the American Sign Language every day and 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 in the training with my personal trainer um uh, who's also hard of hearing 
So it was just like a full schedule um, for a long time. Um, but that's, that can be a real blessing as well, because, you know, like, like you were saying, you were hinting at the fact that they're both languages. They are, you know, mm -hmm. drumming and American Sign Language is both nonverbal communication, really. And I think that, you know, when I speak in Urdu or I speak in English or I speak in French, I feel like there's different sides of me come out in a weird way. You know, maybe I go back to the, ver you know, who I was when I learned that language or the different context. And I think learning the drums and learning American Sign Language they brought out different sides of me. I think they opened me up as an actor in new ways. Um, you know, Ruben is a character who doesn't have a lot of dialogue. So communicating physically or at least being in the body a bit more is something that I needed to do for this, for this performance. But I didn't realize when I was learning the drums and learning sign language, that would do it for me. I thought I was just learning those skills, but it always happens when you learn any kind of skills, it, it spills out in, in unexpected ways and informs your performance. And changes you as a person, you know, mm -hmm. something that I've really kind of been thinking about a lot during the film and since the film is, is what listening really is. Because I feel like my mentors in the deaf community um, that, that I was kind of immersed with for most of that year, they're the best listeners I've ever met. You know, listening isn't something you just do with your ears, it's something you do with your body and your attention. Um, you know, actually, my sign instructor would always tell me that there's a saying in the deaf community that um, hearing people are us in the hearing community are emotionally repressed. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because we hide behind words. That's a very well-known saying in the deaf community. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I started getting better at sign language, I was talking about, you know, emotional things in my life or even the character's life, I found myself tearing up. You know, similar to what you're saying, Taha, is like stuff I'd normally be able to just talk about, I found myself crying. And I asked Jeremy what that was. And he says, look, when you're communicating with your whole body, you connect with it in a different way. You can't hide behind your words. You find yourself getting more emotional. So um, it was it was a real gift, you know, and I'm, I'm so grateful to, to all my teachers in the deaf community who didn't just teach me their language, they taught me so much more. You know, taught me what listening is and what communication is, which as an actor is, you know, so fundamental. Yeah, I imagine so much of obviously acting takes place in the head, but then having to let go of that and for it to kind of resonate through your whole body must have been quite a liberating experience and even picking up on what you said kind of obviously hearing people kind of all of us I suppose have the need to fill those silences those awkward silences with words that sometimes just don't mean anything because there's a level of awkwardness to um a situation um Saha I wanted to come to you next obviously playing Muhammadu obviously is based on a true character who wrote the Guantanamo Diaries while he was imprisoned unjustly in Guantanamo Bay. There must have been a sense of um, responsibility playing someone real. Um, so I wanted to talk about kind of, yeah, based, someone that's living, breathing and playing that person and then perhaps having them as a resource and how that, if that helps or does it hinder your process? Uh, yes, of course, it helped me a lot to, uh, to meet him. By the way, guys, I've seen your movies and your performances are great congratulations i loved it and the movies as well really brother likewise guys really uh yeah i was saying yeah when 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 i have to portray a real life person i like to meet him and spend time with him uh not especially to mimic him because when they're not famous you have you can take some liberty and uh except for child surprise i <laughs> you know <laughs> it was different uh <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, the responsibility, especially with Muhammad, was was very important to me. You know, we're we're dealing with a real person who's been held 14 years in Guantanamo without a single charge against him. You know, he's an innocent man. So uh, to me, it turned out to be even more important than cinema in itself. It was beyond that. So uh, the first. I mean, the first audience member I wanted to please was Mohamedou. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I first met him on, on Skype, you know, I, 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 I had read the book. Uh, I knew a lot about him and, uh, and his philosophy, but I, I, I couldn't really understand and, and put myself in his, in, in his body. How could he be so nice, good, and how could he be... For, you know, forgiven everybody. 
So I was like, yeah, now we're just the two of us. Maybe you can tell me you still have some anger or something. You know? And he was like, no, 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 not at all. And he told me something very important that I, that I took from me in my life. I'm trying to. He said, uh, uh, when you forgive people who did bad things to you, it's a treat you give to yourself. So you can free your mind and eventually uh, change uh, people's mind. And he succeeded. He did it with his guards. He did it with uh, some uh, uh, the people who were surrounding him and some audience members. I had some messages and especially one, a guy who sent me a text saying, I'm in a DM or something. And he said, uh, uh, I was part of these people who hated everything that was connected with 9-11. I was uh, uh, so stubborn that I even stopped a relationship with uh, with a very good friend of mine because he was Middle Eastern. And when he watched the movie, he called him back to ask for forgiveness. So you know, that you understand why I'm saying that sometimes yeah. movies are beyond cinema because it can, you know, help people to, with preconceived ideas, to change their mind and, and maybe look the world in, a, in another direction. Mm. That's the whole, you get to see a world that you, in, in this case, hopefully, that you never get to experience yourself, but just for kind of those 90 minutes or 120 minutes, get to experience a life that, you know, that, you know, you'll never, you'll get to travel to a place, you'll get to see people that you might never know in your own life. And it kind of obviously opens up your level of humanity to people, it kind of it's understanding. Um, Adash, I'm coming to you, so understanding Balram's universe. Um, that must have been quite a feat, kind of playing, um, you're playing polarities, you're playing two sides of an extreme at, at times, the kind of two sides of the human condition, emotional spectrum. How was it to kind of play those two sides? And am I right in thinking that kind of the, you filmed the end before you filmed kind of, it wasn't obviously filming chron chronology and you filmed the end, so then having to flip that kind yeah. of that experience in your head as well. Yeah, that became that became really challenging. Um, actually, to start things off, one of the first things that I really wanted to do was um, was to drive for somebody in Bombay or Delhi, because to really understand what that feels like. But then, who would hire me? Uh, who would hire any person who had no prior driving experience, right? So then, I asked myself, what else can I do? And um, you know, I decided that I should go live in a village for some time because that's that's the origin of Balram, right? Like that's where the seed was planted. And so um, I actually befriended this this guy who used to stay next to my building, and I convinced him in our second meeting to take me to his village. And I was I I told him not to disclose to anybody that I was an actor, um, not even to his family. So everybody in the village thought that I was his friend, and he's a writer, yeah. So like. Everybody in the village thought that I was his friend who was helping him write a story about the village. And um, I stayed in the village for two weeks with his family who were so kind and graceful to host me. And, you know, I would, every day we would just set off on his bike and we would explore all these spots that he had sort of spent his formate, formative years in. And uh, I would meet his friends. I would go for birthday parties. I would go for like some festival that was happening. And the idea was just to basically have a very undiluted experience where people could confide in me and um, tell me about their personal stories, you know, something that I could use uh, for Balram and the way they thought about the world and the way they, they spoke about people from the cities and everything. And do you um, think people, oh no, sorry, I was just, in that experience, do you think people are far more open to divulge kind of information or talk about their lives when they think that you... Um, kind of and not from a middle class background if you were kind of from this life of servitude you, did you find that kind of people opened up to you in a different way yeah I, I definitely feel that if I would have told them that I was an actor that would have changed probably changed their perception and I didn't want that to happen I just wanted to sort of you know um, I mean it's kind of sad that I had to deceive them into it now that I think about <laughs> it but like uh, it was something that was necessary to do right uh, yeah and as I speak I feel so guilty about it because if anybody of them will end up watching this they'll be like that that guy let him come back to love <laughs> <laughs> but 
but yeah i had a great time man i, I and after that i went to delhi and um i thought that i should work at a small stall so i was i, I was working at a thela you call it a thela in hindi uh, so this thela basically served um some rice puri vegetables for 40 rupees a plate and um, i i took 3 days to figure a thela where i could get a job there because everybody wanted to see my my identity card and i wasn't introducing myself as adarsh but as balram so mm-hmm. i had to get a job at a place which wouldn't ask me for my id card so on the third day i found this guy and then he agreed to keep me at his stall for um, basically cleaning the plates and um, you know keeping the keeping the place tidy running some small errands for him he agreed to pay me 100 100 rupees a day and um, i think those 15 days were very very crucial for me to understand balram you know to understand uh how invisible and insignificant in a way his existence is right um and to do something against your will something that you don't really want to do and there were times when i would snap out of out of what i was doing i was cleaning a plate and suddenly i'd tell myself what am i doing here and then i'd be like no this is exactly what balram would ask himself when he was mm-hmm. in the village working at the tea stall because he knew that his potential was something beyond um what everybody else was doing in the village so um yeah working working at that stall for 15 days i think really helped me understand the essence of of balram and thereafter we did we did like a bunch of um i'd say readings with all the actors who were cast for the film so that became i mean uh, you know it was very gracious of ramin to uh, to ask me if i was inter- interested in doing something like that because that really allowed me to sort of experiment with my scenes like much like a boot camp right to try out mm-hmm. my scenes in different ways and to see what's working and what's not um but something that i had an experience before that i experienced with ramin was that in spite of coming from a place of so much knowledge and being so sure about the world and the characters he still let all of us actors really explore ourselves as, as actors and never told us to do how to do the scene you know um he really trusted us with with knowing the people that we were playing and this that and then just allowed us to flow with the scene was there a lot of improvisation involved then lots of improvisation yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like a lot of times you would go in completely unexpected directions and sometimes it wasn't the best sometimes it was great um mats i want to come back to you kind of uh to talk about another round and the the i just the idea of kind of the central theme of this film um do you think that kind of it's a very danish sensibility kind of the idea of you know um kind of uh the in terms of kind of the drinking culture or in terms of kind of how that uh how that shown in the film do you think that is kind of a danish sensibility not anymore i do um, uh, i mean we were afraid obviously that it was too danish in, in that sense uh yeah. it has proven not to be uh obviously the, the the drinking games when you're graduating is very danish but then you will have something else in italy or something that you can recognize in, in america or whatever um but the whole idea the philosophy behind the the the, uh, the paper that he wrote this norwegian philosopher mm-hmm. uh, that we are born with uh, at least two beers too little in our blood system mm-hmm. um makes sense i mean we all we all know what it does to you we know that it lifts conversation we know that You might be even more creative if you dare pick up that phone and make that phone call and um how many people have met their spouses without having alcohol involved somehow so so there is that the positive side of alcohol we know what it is but we rarely talk about it because we also know what the danger is mm-hmm. the danger we have made a lot of beautiful films about and thomas's mission was not to make another one of these he wanted to celebrate it to a degree he also obviously wanted to touch upon the the, the darker side of it but but he, he wanted it to be a celebration of alcohol and more so a celebration of life i mean it's it's no secret that these characters especially mine he's standing on a platform and the train has left him he's mm. he's super he's super regretting his his past and he's enormously jealous on the future and he's simply forgotten to live in the present and embrace life as it is uh, so so that's what the film is about uh, with or without alcohol uh, but we 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 started out thinking it might have been too danish but it turns out that <laughs> every culture can relate to it i mean alcohol <laughs> yeah. has been around for 6000 7000 years mm-hmm. right yeah. but then again i think also the theme is the, 
the Kickstarter of the film is the experiment with the alcohol. The, mm -hmm. the film itself is about life. And I think that oh. might be resonating a lot. Yeah. And also kind of just with your character, Mark, and actually with all of the, your characters, um, uh, you're, all of you are outsiders. Um, mm. to the world that you are within kind of as Martin has obviously even within the experiment he seems like he's the only one that kind of is not always all in is on the edge of kind of you know do I want to do this or not and then obviously then gets convinced into kind of joining um, joining into that kind of you know just on the precipice kind of on yeah. the, in between both worlds yeah I mean and, and then he takes charge he <laughs> then yeah. he's leading the way right I mean well, it turns out to work for him fairly mm -hmm. well in the beginning and then really well. And if, if two is good, why, why isn't four better? Why mm -hmm. isn't six three times as good? Okay. So the classical uh, downfall, he, he's, um, he's leading the way with that. But, but it is a success to degree. But what they don't realize is that they are having their head stuck up in their own whatever. Mm -hmm. And they, they forget to look at each other. And, and one of the friends is not in the same position as they are. And, and they didn't see it coming. Mm. Um, I'm going to change tack completely, but still talk. I want to talk about the dancing because sure. the guy, it's, like, it's just <laughs> joyous. Yeah, and it's it. and like, let's talk about you it. know, did what? How what, was it always there? Did, was it written in for you? Am I right in thinking that you you are a trained dancer? Or have I just have I missed yeah. out that somewhere along the way? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was a dancer for. I was a gymnast, and then I became a professional dancer for nine odd years. Uh, and this is 30, 30 rusty years ago. Um, <laughs> it was always there. Um, it was placed in the middle and then it went to the end and then it was back again, back and forth. And, and we had a lot of discussions, me and Thomas. I, I wasn't necessarily against dancing in a film. I just really wanted to be persuaded how we could pull it off. Uh, in my world, when you make a realistic film, it can maybe come across as quite pretentious if somebody starts dancing all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always tried to convince Thomas that it should be his um, drunken imagination, you know, a heightened scene somehow. And Thomas was super polite and nodding and listening every time. And he just said, no, you're just dancing, man. That's what I want to see. Um, and uh, I can happily say that he was 100% right and I was 100% wrong. It, it turned out to, to, we pulled it off. But, but not only because he was right, but also because the circumstances were so beautiful. All the youngsters were like intoxicated by life in that scene. And they were dancing at least, they were dancing inside of themselves at that point. So, so they were not looking at me as a, a spect uh, spectacle, but, they, but they, was, they were just part of the scene. So, so we could pull it off. And it was not about the aesthetics of dancing. It was about the, the inner journey that this character has been mm. through. He's just, he's just lost someone he loved dearly. Uh, and he's just regained someone he, lo he loves dearly within the last hour. So we wanted to, to make a portrait of a man who wants to fly and he wants to drown at the same time. And I think that might be the reason why we, we did pull it off. Yeah, yeah. it's sadness and joy all combined into like, this beautiful, beautiful um, piece. Mm. Um, Riz, I wanted to come back to you talking kind of the idea of obviously being an outsider and obviously... Um, you know, you become an outsider to the world, you know, and then you become, you are an outsider to a world that's, you know, um, a new, um, a new landscape for your character. So I wanted to talk about how you worked with Daria as a director kind of to create kind of a sound, a personal soundscape for you to be able to kind of build that character authentically. Yeah, well, I guess there's, um, you know, you, I, I don't know, I, I always find that when you're, the journey that the character is going through is also somehow mirrored in terms of what you go through as an actor. And so I guess, you know, my character, Ruben, he's a hearing character who's experiencing deaf culture for the first time and understanding what it is. And, you know, that was what was happening with me. Um, you know, to begin with, Ruben thinks of deafness as something that's a lack, is cutting him off from himself and others. Um, but then he starts to realize how rich deaf culture is. And that, that was also my journey, you know, understanding the richness of it all. Um, and in terms of really experiencing deafness, you know, I think sometimes can people think that the experience of deafness is the experience of not hearing things. That That is part of it. Um, but the experience of deafness is also the experience of deaf culture, like I was talking about, that really embodied communication, um, that very kind of collectivist outlook. 
you know, a hearing culture is generally a lot more individualistic than, than deaf culture, where people have to really rely on each other to share information. You know, um, there's this saying that if you want a secret to get out, tell a deaf person. Because, you know, deaf community, there's this kind of, this unspoken implicit bond that you, you learn some information, you share it, you know, because the hearing culture always tries to keep us on the outside of information, on the outside looking in. So you know, that was a big part of the experience, going to deaf poetry slams and just making friends in that community. Um, but in terms of the, the technical, physiological experience of it, there was one thing we did, which is we had an idea of using audio blockers. So we took these hearing aids and we placed them, modified them to emit a white noise. And we placed them deep into my ear canal. So for those sections of the film where Ruben is initially losing his hearing and he feels very thrown off balance by it, and it's a very intense you know, uh, kind of experience, we use those audio blockers. So I'd be kind of doing a scene and then all of a sudden Darius would activate the audio blockers and I just suddenly wouldn't be able to hear anything. And I said, I couldn't even hear my own voice. And there was, you know, several days on set where we just left them on the whole day. And it, it's, it's really intense. I guess it gave me a glimpse of what it feels like to suddenly go through that process of hearing loss, to suddenly feel cut off from that sense. Um, you know, as the film progressed and, uh, you know, for Ruben, he starts to realize that deafness isn't something that cuts him off from himself and, and others. It's actually a way for him to connect more to his true self in silence and more to others than maybe he ever has, we didn't use those audio blockers anymore. By that point, actually, it was most of the people on set were deaf. Most, you know, we had just had lots of deaf actors. And so both on camera and off camera, we were just communicating in American Sign Language at that point. So we didn't, we didn't use the audio blockers for that anymore. Um, so we tried to kind of take a character-led approach um, on, on when we were using those technical tools that made me feel off balance. Um, or not. Um, kind of Im immersing yourself um, in a sensory kind of experience. So I just wanted to know how you worked with Kevin and if you did kind of obviously so much of um, what we see of your characters obviously in Guantanamo in various cells or kind of in, in confinement of some sort. And I just wondered how um, if there was kind of sensory things put in place for you to do that or you know or if it was a case of kind of finding that place within your own head uh, yeah. yes i look i i tried to find it in my own head mm -hmm. like uh as you know as an actor sometimes it depends on your life experience you can use uh what you have in your head in your guts and uh, what you've been through and this time it was just not possible i mean how could i possibly know what it is to be tortured and, and uh, mistreated this way, to be treated as a virus finally, because uh, they would wear uh, rubber glo gloves, uh, masks, and would call them by numbers. So Muhammad was 760. And uh, to, I, I, I tried my best and I couldn't find another way. For example, if I had to, uh, I don't know, I, I played in a, in, a TV, in a show, I was playing a trumpeter so I would train and train and train over and over, and then I come on set, and if I if I if I worked enough and I had enough time, it's okay, right? Uh, this time I couldn't, you know, uh, wear shackles 24 hours a day in my hotel rooms. <laughs> so I thought, why uh, recreate when you can create? Mm -hmm. And plus, I couldn't do it otherwise. So I, out of respect to Mohammedu and the people who are still living this and my director and the audience, I needed to get as close as possible to his actual conditions so I could convey authenticity. I, I didn't, I couldn't, and I didn't want to sell something. So, uh, so yeah, I asked them to turn the cells as cold as possible to, I wore real shackles. Um, you know, I, I got waterboarded, but it was intense, really. And, and I had to lose a lot of weight in a short amount of time because I was shooting something. I only had three weeks to, to match physically uh, with Mohamedou. And uh, the last six days of the shooting were very intense because it was all the interrogation scenes and, and, the, torturing, and the torture scenes. So, you know, when you fast that hard and, and, and you, you get so exhausted, it, it, it's, it becomes more of an experience than a performance. And, 
and you, you, you know, your spirit fly to some emotional mm-hmm. places that, that are unexpected. And I, I, I don't know, I couldn't do it otherwise. And, and, and at some point I really felt it. I felt it, but it has nothing to do with Muhammad. I mean, I knew in the back of my mind that I would go back to my hotel room mm-hmm. when we wrap. But yeah, there was one moment very strange because uh, uh, of course I happened to have some tools to portray Muhammad culturally wise and, you know, and uh, we lost, I mean, he lost his mom when, while he was there. I did too. And uh, when we had to play that scene, it was the last day of shooting when, when he hallucinates and he sees his mom in the cell. Uh, you know, I, I almost saw my own mom. It was so strange. So I said to I said to Kevin, I can only do it once, you know, just one take, mm-hmm. and and I collapsed. But uh, yeah, it was uh, I I I needed it. I couldn't do it otherwise. I'm I don't know. Some some actors are gifted enough to just you know live it through their inside of their head. I I I just couldn't. Yes. Um. I think it's all, it's a pattern that all four of you obviously have gone to ex- different extremes with um, in all of your portrayals and that's kind of obviously why they've been recognised. Um, haven't planned this, but I always think it, the most interesting co- uh, things come out of kind of when actors talk to each other. And I wonder if any of you have any questions for each other that you haven't had a chance to ask. You know, I could let you sit with that for a couple of minutes and I can go on. But, if you know, maybe think about it. If there's things that you want to ask about each other's roles, um, you know, please do feel free to do that. Um, I also want to talk about Chadwick Boseman's performance um, as L- Levy in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Um, his untimely passing last year uh, left a huge void, um, but his legacy will forever be remembered through... Um, his unflinching commitment to all of his performances. Um, there is a Q&A available with um, some, of the, some of his co-stars and the filmmakers for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and we will post information of that in the chat so you are able to hear some of his cast members talk about him. Um, but also just wanted to ask, um, again, um, only if you want to, if any of you have seen Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and you'd like to talk about his performance, please feel free to do so. Um. Yeah, I just I just want to say what, what something which is, I think, it's really it's really a kind of um, it's a beautiful thing really to see how I think Chadwick's work is is being celebrated. Um, you know, I think he's someone who's kind of came to global attention like relatively recently, um, and and it's feels really clear that the kind of choices that he's made were kind of driven by something that is actually beyond cinema. It's kind of like what you're talking about, Taha, you know, and I think that actually, particularly in this moment when we're in such a kind of divided society, there's so many kind of political divisions and political problems, and actually we've lost faith in our politics. A lot of us are kind of looking to stories and storytellers to heal us and to tell it, give us a story that we belong. When actually so many politicians are giving us stories that we don't belong and trying to divide us. I think it's stories and storytellers bringing us together. And I think that he's kind of really exemplified that, you know, in terms of some of the actors of our generation. Um, I think he's kind of really made choices in, in portraying characters that can kind of stretch culture. You know, that's something that I always think about is whenever I take on a role, does it stretch me and does it stretch culture? And I think that he's someone who's really kind of been guided, you know, um, by this idea of stretching culture um, and breaking the mold. So I, I don't know, I kind of feel like, um, you know, it's, it's something that's, you know, we talk about his legacy and of course he has his own legacy, but I also kind of think almost for myself and for other actors of, of my generation and younger, like what can we take, what lessons can we take on board from his work? You know, always try and learn from 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 my peers and trying to learn from these incredible actors here. You know, and of course, Anthony Hopkins' performance. You know, at the age of eighty three to be pushing himself and doing all these kind of crazy things I've never seen him do before. It's mind blowing. And when I kind of think about what I might be able to learn, I, I, I kind of go back to this um, this thing that Chadwick would often speak about, which is about um, finding your purpose. And I think if you can find a purpose that's beyond just the work, that's bigger than and other than yourself. Is connecting to something bigger, and I think that can be really impactful. Um, you know, certainly with our film, knowing that it was connected to 
I don't know, trying to trying to remedy some of the representations of the deaf community. I think I, I found that very animating. So yeah, just understanding that it sometimes is, is bigger than movies. You know, mm. uh, I think is uh, is is a great lesson to take on from his work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say that I, I, I didn't know the man and I wish I could have met him and just, you know, to witness uh, the way he works because he's done so, as you said, Riz, uh, he, he was doing so many different roles and as an actor, that's what you're trying to, to find, you're trying to find truth and do, you know, explore different characters and he was doing it so, uh, so well and his last performance was... Uh, uh, amazing. I mean, it touched me uh, very deeply, and uh, and um, yeah, when I think about him, because knowing what he was going through makes it even more admirable, you know. And he's uh, he's a real a real inspiration to a lot of people now, and 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 became uh, a beautiful message for the new generations. Thank you. Um... We have so many questions, so let's try and get through some of them. Um, okay, so um, one for all of you. What is the best piece of advice a director has given you? Um, hey, true. It's actually, sorry, go ahead. Just this. One director told me someday, stay truthful and, and generous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was it was this thing that Rami never called action on set. Neither did he ever call cut. So for the past 10 years, every project that I was part of, that it suddenly changed the whole thing because the moment that started happening, I realized that I didn't feel like a bot anymore. <laughs> that I wasn't trying to be somebody, but I was mm. just I was just there. That I was That's always ready. You know? Sense yeah, of yeah. It it felt so um, normal, like, and cut was when he would just walk into frame. So you would be doing the <laughs> scene, and then he would like go beyond beyond whatever the scene was written. Like, and then Ramin would be part of the scene. Like, he would be one of the co-actors, and he like, what oh, scene though? <laughs> yeah, he, he was. I was done ten minutes ago. I don't know what you're both doing. Um, I, I have two. I mean, uh, yeah. it's not really. One is a direction, another one is just an advice. The first one, the advice is like, uh, take your space, take, take the room. It's, it's your room now, don't wait. Um, unless, of course, you're playing a guy who's hiding. But, but I mean, the, sometimes you can be too polite, you can be too nervous, you can be in doubt of certain things. But if you don't take the room, you're not going to make the scene work, you know. Secondly, I have a, had a director who's often said when we were improvising, you know, he gave us a start and a finish, A to A to Z, and he didn't care how we got there, as long as we made him feel like this, he would say. Then he would come up with something, make me feel like this when you leave the scene. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting because it could have been a thousand things, but somehow it was one thing. And it's always been very inspiring. Amazing. Um, <laughs> There's, um, it's kind of weird because I feel like in many ways Sound of Metal was a new, it was a new process for me, you know. Uh, a lot of the time is a lot of uh, kind of, I, I don't know, I always do a lot of interviews with people, interview people for hours and hours and listen to the recording, do a lot of research. I did that with this, I, I had to, but it was also kind of living in the experience. And in a way, I feel like the best thing that director can do often isn't so much what they say to you, it's the process that they create around you, it's the environment that they create on mm -hmm. set. I feel like that it's that intangible kind of thing that really influences your performance and your work. And and really, I think it's it's kind of a big part of it. It's also shooting in sequence. It's I think that's the, one of the biggest gifts a director can give you. It's like coming in and giving direction. I feel less and less is like the thing that impacts my work. It's the working conditions. It's the atmosphere. It's the vibe they create with Darius. And then Sound of Metal, it was one of the most beautiful processes because we, sh we shot it in sequence. So it became a lived experience. You know, every goodbye we were saying, man, I'm saying goodbye to this actor. They're about to get on a plane after this. They're not going to be allowed on set. Well, I'm saying goodbye now to this deaf community. I'm not going to be 
learning ASL anymore. So it, I don't know. I just feel like it's the, it's the working conditions. In a way, I feel like the best direction is when it's when they say less mm -hmm. and they just create the conditions around you. They just put you in that situation. They just bring in that supporting artist or the actor without telling you it's about to happen and it just happened, you know? So uh, I feel it's, it's more about the, yeah, making you their little guinea pig in their process <laughs> rather than uh, telling you anything. Um, I think the process has worked out very well for you in all of these roles. Um, we have a question from Paul Westwood for all panelists. Um, oh, I think we might, we might have answered this slightly, but he said, films are often shot out of sequence. I was wondering how you keep hold of where you are emotion in each scene while shooting. Um, do you heavily annotate scripts or do you trust or remember where your character is? Um, Adash, I might come to you on this. And I think we touched on it briefly, but obviously uh, you shot the end, didn't you, first for The White Tiger. Um, and obviously kind of your character was in a very, very different place at that point. And it, yeah, so to answer Paul's question, how did that affect your process? You know, it wasn't really the end because we kept intercutting between um, the Balram from Bangalore to the Balram mm. from the village. So, uh, but it, it was very tricky. Um, also because I felt like I had spent more time as um, the Balram from the village while my preparation was going on. Um, and I wasn't quite sure about how my, um, mm. how uh, the Bangalore businessman would land. I was quite apprehensive about it. But the way I really go about it is that <clears throat> I make sure that I know the script at the back of my head, um, you know, completely. So I make sure that I go through the script a bunch of times, like more than a dozen times. And then before the scene, I always take some time off and, uh, you know, I used to sit with Ramin and discuss the whole graph of wherever, you know, what all Balram has gone through till this point. And I would do that every time for the smallest of scenes. So <laughs> I guess, yeah, that, that's very important, right? Because it does get very confusing sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and Matt, for you with another <clears throat> round, kind of, did you shoot in chronology or if not kind of, obviously your character is in very different emotional state during the mm. film? No, no, we did not, but we did as much as we could. And I completely agree with Riff. It's, um, it's a gift when you, when you get the chance to do it. But for a ton of reasons, you can't always do that. If you have the chance, do it. Uh, but but Thomas did his best to make it chronologically. Uh, what I normally do, is, just like you said, uh, you read it again and again. You go back. You, you go back 20 pages back, 30 pages back before you do the scene if it's out of order. And even if you haven't shot these scenes, you relive them. You rethink them. You might not be in all of the scenes. You, you, you take your own little pitch. Where is my character? What's happening? But you also kind of try to stay on top of it. Where is the audience now? How much can we push this envelope when we see this again, right? So it's all about trying to get into the flow as if you did it chronologically. Uh, so the only way you can do that is just go back, read it again, get into the emotion, isolate yourself, go and shoot. That's actually something I've never thought of. And there's an interesting point kind of, do you all have that thought, where is the audience at this point? Kind of, is that something that you, and of think about kind of emotionally, where should they be at this point? No, I'm not, I, mean, I didn't mean the audience, yeah, audience. Yeah. I mean the script. Where is the yeah. script? Where does the yeah. script want us? I, I mean, see. How, how did it catch me the first time I read it? Yeah. And I should try to relive that, even though we yeah. haven't shot it, right? Yeah. That's what I meant. Um, So it's a question for everyone. Um, have you struggled or are you still struggling to leave or get out of the roles that you have played? And that's from Marwa Buchala. Saha kind of obviously say Muhammadu, that must have been a heightened emotional experience kind of, yeah. How was it kind of in the days and the weeks after or even kind of at the day of, a sh at the end of a shoot kind of how, yeah. How, what, what was your head like? Uh, usually, I don't find it hard to to leave a character on set at the mm -hmm. end of the shooting. Uh, really, you know, you have the rap party, and you know, bye bye, go to the other <laughs> one. <laughs> but this time, it was uh, 
a whole different gig. You know, I, I didn't expect it, but it stayed with me. He stayed with me for uh, about three weeks. And it was so strange because uh, no matter how I tried to get away, I couldn't. And uh, it faded away slowly day by day. But I remember I was talking to my wife and she was just, I, I was, you know, somewhere else. She was like, hey, just, mm. you know, tell me what happened. And I'm like, I can't, I don't know what happened there. You know, I, I uh, you, you should have been there in a way. Sometimes on set, you, you know, you do your thing. You're an actor, you, you get professional, you understand the cameras. And, and sometimes you just don't know what's happening between action and cut. You don't know. Sometimes you lose it. Sometimes you're here. Sometimes you're not, you're not here. And it's very hard to explain. And I don't know, three weeks is the first time in my life. Usually it's okay. I suppose then kind of for all of you, maybe it's going a little bit too deep. But obviously you spend so much of your life playing other people. How hard is it then to connect back into reality? Is it, um, or, does it or does it depend simply on the kind of last role you've done or... You know, is there always a transition period? Oh, it's a tough That's, one. I mean, yeah. we all, we all try to leave our characters um, somehow, so that so we don't have to force our kids to call us a different name every time we work. Right? <laughs> uh, and 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 I think that's the, the the professional approach. But as you said, it it's the hard. You said sometimes it's not as easy. Um, but but for me, it's it's not necessarily the character because I've played insane characters that it's is are not nice guys, mm. but the character himself is having a great time. So so that experience might rub off on me that I'm actually having a great time when I come home. It rubs off a little, right? Um, so so if you if you had a great day at the office, uh, you bring that back home. If you had a terrible day at the office, you will also bring that home like everybody else in the world. And and a and a great day can actually be being in a scene that is terrible, brutal, heartbreaking to be in. But if it went right, you should, you should try to bring that energy back home and not the terrible situation back home. Mm. And this is what we're trying to look for. It's not, we are not always successful. Uh, Adash, how was it kind of leaving Balram? <laughs> it's kind of tricky, you know, because um, as Matt said, like sometimes you play these characters that, you know, do... Um, do things that you wouldn't agree with necessarily or that you term evil or bad in some way. And uh, I'd say that I've been sort of lucky that the nicer traits of the character stick with me sometimes. Like, for example, um, you know, with Balram, Balram has this thing where every time Ashok wants to sit in the car, he would run and open the open the back, back door for him to sit. And Ashok would think it's completely unnecessary because nobody does that in America. But then Balram wants to do it. And, I found myself doing that after the film. I mean, not run and open the door, <laughs> but I would just involuntarily open the back door for people and they would mistake it for chivalry. And I'm not saying that I'm not chivalrous otherwise. But it took me like a few times after it happened, I realized this. I developed this habit because of Balram. And I quite like it. I embrace that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's a good habit to have. It's a great yeah. habit. Yeah. So how's your how's your cooking now? Are you cooking uh, rice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's the cooking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> from the tip from the tailor. But um, you know, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that my view on this kind of changed a little bit. Where I, I kind of feel like um, I used to approach things from a slightly more technical point of view, and I think that. Uh, frankly as well, you know, the other actors on this call aren't British, but I think that can often be the British approach, particularly in the theatre tradition where you come in, you do, you, you approach the work technically, you break down the script, you come on like a craftsman or, you know, you come in, you, you do it and you switch off. And more and more, I kind of feel like th th that is a way of working. And I think you need those technical aspects. You need that technical ability to separate your life from your work as well. You know, luckily I don't have kids right now, so I'll, I'll come home and call myself whatever I, I want right now. But um, but I do think that part of the point of this is to lose control. If you are in control of your performance, then part of your performance will be dead. And I think that exactly what you were you talking about, Taha, where you're saying you kind of have to let the Holy Ghost take you somewhere that you weren't expecting. If you go into a scene knowing how that scene is going to play, or even if the director knows how they're going to play, then how are you going to be surprised? I think the whole purpose of cinema is to capture something 
unplanned and spontaneous as it is happening. And so in order for that to happen, you have to be out of control. You have to set all the preparation and the conditions in your muscle memory, uh, you know, to, to be able to go in there and, and lose control, I, I think, you know, on some level. And so if that bleeds over into your real life, I think it's kind of inevitable. You know, something that I'm finding is I get crazy kind of cramps or rashes now stuff when I'm starting to do rolls. <laughs> I don't know if you guys get this. When I was doing the night of, um, you know, I started getting this crazy rash. It's crazy <laughs> rash on like my body. I was like, what the hell is going on? They had to use makeup on me and stuff. And because it was the tension and the stress of, you know, and the responsibility of like, mm. you know, portraying these people who had been in prison. And, and similarly with, with Sound of Metal, it was insomnia, crazy insomnia, you know, um, to the point where I thought I was convinced it was the mattress. And I went out and in the first week of filming, I bought three different mattresses. <laughs> I went out, I was like, mattress doesn't work. So I went out and got to change it, I changed it. I went, I said to production, I was like, listen, you gotta, you gotta split the cost of a mattress with me. This is, this is, <laughs> Yeah. Like, all right, cool. Then the next mattress I went, I went, I'll, I'll buy the next one myself. Maybe yeah. that's it. <laughs> three of them. And then I was, I realized, you know, this is part of the process. And, and just to finish up, I wanted to say that I, I kind of hope that a part of each character does stay with you forever. Mm. Because, you know, the journey that you go on as an actor, you know, listening to what you were talking about, Adarsh, is, you know, how do I play this guy from the village? It's like every time as an actor you approach a character, you think, how the hell am I going to play this guy? How the hell am I going to be a, a duff, deaf punk drummer? How am I going to be a Guantanamo detainee? You know, for Mads, maybe how am I going to be an alcoholic? Was a bit easier. But, you know, I'm joking, I'm joking. But, you know, you always think, how am I going to get there? How am I going to do it? And the lesson you learn at the end of every project is we're all the same. Underneath the differences that separate us, there's this core of humanity. And you, you relearn that lesson every time. It's like, you're at the end, you're like, this is me. This character is me. Hopefully that's how the audience feel. This character is me. So once you've opened up that new part of yourself, I hope it stays with you. You know what I mean? I hope these characters stay with us because then we're expanding our idea of, you know, who we are as actors, but also as audiences. I think you're completely right, Rose. I think why all of your films um, have done so well and how, why all your performances are outstanding is because they at the end of the day just connect on very different levels of the human experience and human condition and everyone can kind of in part take something from all of them that they innately understand or feel empathy or sympathy towards um i think we might be out of time but i just want to thank you all for sharing so much thank you for sharing your films or for the people at home who haven't had a chance to see um the nominated films they are available on all major platforms um, in the UK and internationally as well. Um, thank you so much for your time, Mads Mittelson, Zahar Rahim, Adash Garab, and Riz Ahmed, and good luck. Thank you. Well, it was great talking to you guys. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, yeah, thank thank you. You. Uh, I good wish I could have, have met all, all of you in person you and given you all like, the tightest hug. I wish I could have. <laughs> just, like, but this I, is so I, amazing. I, to, to see that I hope everyone I, will win you all can respond yeah. and we can respond to each other because I've grown up watching mm -hmm. all of y'all and it's just incredible for me guys are you just well, feel, about how you young like you it. are <laughs> are you just showing off about how young you are right now Adar? <laughs> oh, <man>. thank you <laughs> thank you all so much uh, best of luck all bye. Of you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. bye bye everyone bye, bye.